Hey everyone and welcome to The Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host, Michael Montalvo, and for the next few minutes, we will swim through the river of time to find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode, we examine the events that occurred February 10th. We all know about top-selling musical acts, the most popular being that of the new kids on the block. But if you will follow me, step by step, I got a funny feeling that time is on our side while we talk about music on today's episode. In fact, if I could tell the artist in today's topic just one thing, I would say, you got it, parentheses, the right stuff. So call it what you want, but hold on. As I remember when, the boys in the band were sporting that big band sound, and New Kids on the Block have nothing to do with this episode, we're talking about Glenn Miller. Look, I saw an opportunity to make some jokes with song titles and I took it. I guess I should stop making jokes like this, but then how am I supposed to reach joke number 705 if I don't make the obvious ones? Do you know what it takes for music to get certified gold? To get a gold record, you must sell 500,000 units. Platinum is a million, multi-platinum is 2 million, and diamond is 10 million. Quick side note, did you know that after the Diamond Award was introduced in 1999, Santana's 2000 album Supernatural reached that milestone within its first year? The Recording Industry Association of America, according to their website, is the trade organization that supports and promotes the creative and financial vitality of the major music companies. What this means is that they work to protect creative freedom and promote the work that record labels do to support artists. Again, according to their website. This means that they are the ones protecting against piracy and the ones warning parents by using the parental advisory label. They are also the ones behind the gold and platinum awards, which celebrate achievement in the marketplace. This is a task they have been doing since 1958 with the first gold single, Catch a Falling Star, by the one and only Perry Como. Now wait just a minute, I hear you say to me. I was in the mood to talk about Glenn Miller, not Perry Como. So, what gives? The year was 1942, and on this day, February 10th, Glenn Miller was awarded the first ever gold disc slash record for selling 1.2 million copies of Chattanooga Choo Choo. Chattanooga Choo Choo, Glenn Miller, gold? Hold your horses, I'm getting to all that. Glenn Miller was born March 1st, 1904 in Clarinda, Iowa, to parents Elmer and Maddie Lou. The Millers moved a lot during Glenn's early years and eventually made it to Nebraska, where Elmer bought his son a mandolin, which was soon traded for a horn. The musical kind, not the animal kind. The family would move again to Missouri, and that's when Miller began playing trombone in the town band. But this was short-lived, and the family moved again, this time to Fort Morgan, Colorado, where he joined the high school band, and this was all by the time he was 14. They moved a lot. After graduating high school, he joined a band and quit, went to the University of Colorado and quit, then moved to Los Angeles to pursue music. During this time, he also met and married his wife, Helen, although it was while he was at the university. He also began recording with the Noble Orchestra and the Dorsey Brothers. In 1938, Glenn Miller and his orchestra became a big thing, and he started to record records. Tuxedo Junction sold 115,000 copies in its first week, which is an impressive feat for the time. All this quickly brings us to the Chattanooga Choo Choo. The song was originally written for the film Sun Valley Serenade, 1941, and in it, it was performed by Miller and his orchestra with vocalists Tex Benneke, Paula Kelly, and Dorothy Dandridge. Songwriters Mark Gordon and Harry Warren were inspired to write the song on an actual train, an actual Chattanooga choo-choo, just not the Chattanooga choo-choo. 
The funny bit about this whole story is that they were writing on the Birmingham special at the time, but felt that the Birmingham choo-choo didn't quite have the same ring to it. The song itself is about a man who is going home to see his sweetheart to promise to her that he would not roam around and see other women. It came out at a time that many men were going to fight in the war, and so part of the inspiration for the song came from the idea that a soldier was returning home. The song would go on to be nominated for, but ultimately lost, the Academy Award, but as such, proved itself to be a huge hit. By February 10, 1942, the song had become so popular that it had sold 1.2 million copies. RCA Victor, Miller's record label, wanted to do something special for the milestone, and presented Miller with a gold record on his radio show. Paul Douglas, the show's announcer, took to the air and explained to Miller, I think everyone listening in on the radio should know, Glenn, it actually is a recording of Chattanooga Choo Choo, but it's in gold, solid gold, and is really fine. In truth, it wasn't a solid gold record, it was a pressing plate that had been painted gold. This act became something that other labels started doing and that led to the founding of the Recording Industry Association of America and Perry Como's 1958 achievement of the first RIAA Gold Award. So where is Miller's gold record now? It was actually donated to the University of Colorado in Boulder by Johnny Miller Hoffman, and it can be seen in the Heritage Center in Old Main. As for Glenn Miller, what happened to him? As previously mentioned, this was during a time of war, and many men enlisted to go fight for their country. Some, such as Stan Lee, Walter Matthau, James Stewart, and Mel Brooks, would return home. Glenn Miller would not. In 1942, the same year he would be awarded his gold record, Miller volunteered to join the Air Force in order to entertain the troops. He founded the Glenn Miller Army Air Force Band, but on December 15, 1944, while flying in particularly bad weather during a bad winter, the plane he was on disappeared over the English Channel. From my many minutes of research, no wreckage or body was found, at least not until 1987, when a fisherman brought up what some think are the remains of his plane. But that is still to be seen. That's gonna do it for us today. If you like this, at po- hmm. that's gonna do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out. And helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the year was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme, and thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.